We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. There is nothing that sucks the meaning out of your life quicker than divorce. And because it's such a big event, we think marriage breakdown has to be caused by big problems. However, I know from 35 years helping couples in crisis, the reality is far from what we imagine. Often it's the little things repeated over and over again which become like a cancer and spread through the whole marriage. So what would happen if we could spot these problems early, change the ways we react and stop marriages turning toxic in the first place? That's why I loved a post called She Divorced Me Because I Left the Dishes by the Sink. I shared it on my Twitter feed and it set it on fire. I thought I have to meet the guy who wrote it. Little did I know that this post had been read over four million times. So my witness today is Matthew Fry, who's turned that blog into a book called This Is How Your Marriage Ends, which is out in April 2022, but available now for pre-order. Matthew also coaches other men on how to avoid the same mistakes he made. So tell me about the end of your marriage. How did the breakup impact on you? It's a good question. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And uh, I think you summed it up really well when you talked about this idea of divorce depriving you or robbing you of purpose. That was exactly my experience with it. I had what I refer to as a charmed life for the first 32, 33-ish years of my life until my marriage started to deteriorate. Not in a, in a material way, not even in an enriching life experience, culturally diverse way. I didn't get to go many places. My family didn't have a lot of money, but I was very rich in friends and family. And I just had a really sort of safe, connected, good childhood. I didn't experience anything like overtly horrible other than maybe my parents divorced when I was four, but I managed that. Okay. And when she left, I, you know, I felt like I had nothing. And in a lot of ways, and my son too, I've got a little boy, he's 13 now, but he was four at the time. And um, it really sucks the wind out of you from like a life standpoint. And you were crying all the time, basically, oh, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I was. It's funny. I say it because I think it's sort of like dramatic and it raises your hand and says like, this is who I was. But I was like guy who didn't really cry. I don't know if it was a fake tough guy thing, but I didn't perceive myself to be like guy who cries that much, but I was not well. For, for a pretty long time until and, I started to do the work. And what actually started you doing the work then? And, and what do you mean by the work? Okay, so what's interesting about it, what ended my marriage, and you were infinitely more familiar with it than I am, were all of these things I didn't fundamentally understand were harming my marriage. And once I realized how bad it can get, how dark it can get, how painful it can get, I selfishly began to say, I need to make sure that this doesn't happen ever again. I need to protect myself, my future self, my son from ever experiencing anything like this again. And then obviously it branches out, not obviously, but I'd like to point out, it does branch out to other people. I do not want to subject others to this same experience that I had. And in that process that, that began sort of selfishly, wanting to understand how my marriage failed, wanting to understand how I found myself here in order to make sure that it didn't happen again, I learned an enormous amount about what it means to serve others rather than be locked inside your own head all the time. You said, you know, you lived a charmed life beyond your parents getting divorced when you were four. Now, personally, I would think of that as the opposite of a charmed life. So what happened and what memories did you have of that? My parents split when I was four. It's 500 miles apart, the two towns that my parents lived in. So it wasn't as if I went and saw dad on the weekends. I saw him months. There were massive stretches where I didn't see one of my parents for a given time. I lived with my mom during the school year and during holiday breaks, I was with my father. And it was challenging. Emotionally speaking, I didn't like it. That was the thing that made me cry in my youth. But I guess what I mean is my family was very loving, both sort of my father's world and my mother's world. My friends were wonderful. I didn't experience violence and crime and mistreatment 
everyone was great. There wasn't overtly horrible behavior that I don't believe ended my parents' marriage. And there certainly wasn't overtly horrible behavior in either of my families or any of my social circles in these various places. Did your mother remarry and you see a man and a woman interacting? And, and both did you of my parents remarried when I was relatively young. Within five or so years of their divorce, they both had other spouses who were wonderful. I mean, their family. And so you had sort of good role models, you would say, for men and women and how they interact and how they solve problems. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I don't believe what I have come to believe is a healthy relationship model. My entire take is that we don't even know what will hurt us. So no, I don't think they represented the keys to successful, connected, intimate, long-term trusting relationship in these nuanced ways that I dabble in today. But they were exceedingly decent people and led with love. And that can take you pretty far. OK, well, we'll come to what you've learned in a moment, but I yeah. just want to sort of take you on your emotional journey, because what was really tough for you was not only had your wife decided that she didn't want to be married to you anymore and your son was not with you all the time, but there was another man on the scene as well. How was that playing into your brain? <laughs> OK, so that was rough. When my marriage ended, and I want to make something abundantly clear because I have a very good relationship with my son's mother. She is a lovely, wonderful person. We get along really well. There's a lot of mutual respect. Our marriage died a very slow death. We were not in the same bedroom for 18 months. It was dead before I knew it was dead. I understand this in a way today that I just didn't understand at the time where I was really resentful and feeling sorry for myself. So not terribly long after our separation, I learned that she was seeing somebody. And that felt very soon for me in the context of I'm mourning the loss of my marriage. But I understand, again, the, the, the framing is so important because back then I didn't know how to see it the way I see it now. Anyway, when you are filtering everything through this lens of she did this to me, she abandoned me, my life's hard and it's her fault. It's really awful when your partner is with someone else while you're miserable and feeling as if she quit on you. I just believe very strongly that is an intellectually dishonest narrative, but it's the one I believed when it happened about nine years ago. So at this point, you did something which was sort of a little bit revolutionary in guy world. You decided to, you decided to go and see a therapist. What was that experience like for you? I didn't do what I perceived to be the right thing, which is go literally form a relationship with a therapist and see him or her repeatedly and build trust and intimacy. I leveraged my company's human resources benefits, and I called this 1-800 number after I drank a bunch of alcohol one night. And Ooh, that, that always helps a therapy that session. Was, it was great. And I, uh, I called this woman and I felt really bad for her. And we talked and I just told her, you know, it was a babbling, borderline, almost wanting to cry version of like what we're talking about now. But in real time, she was the person that put the idea in my head to write these things down as a means of processing, as a means of dealing with it. And I'm confident she meant journal like an adult in like a private, <laughs> you know, book. But instead, <laughs> I, I drank more the following night or two and I started a blog. And give me a taste of the tone of the drunken blog to start off with. It was, it was not anything like who I try to show up as today. It was sort of a dark comedy. I'm like, oh, well, my wife left and now I'm just this 33, 34 year old, bumbling, idiot, divorced, life sucks, single father. I mean, this is going to be a real joy to like go live the rest of my life and try to have fun and do anything that matters ever again. We, we separated the first day of April that year, and I didn't start writing on the internet until the summer. But that's all one big blur of like crying and watching Netflix. But I think that it's really important to talk about how bad the divorce was from your point of view, because, and this is one of the things I think is really important about your story, is guys generally don't talk about how bad divorce is. They sort of grin and bear it. They don't tell the other guys how bad it is. And so when each man discovers for himself how bad divorce is, it's a sort of shock. And he says to his friends, why didn't you tell me? And they said, well, you wouldn't want to know. 
And yet you are actually saying how difficult divorce is. Why do you think men are so silent about it? I, mean, I think there's a variety of reasons. I think mostly rooted in gender roles and sexism per se. I think this notion of talking about your feelings is getting a lot better. But I still think by and large, in every culture I've encountered, men are not inclined to vulnerably share true things they feel. If they calculate, it's going to communicate weakness or incompetence or something bad, something flawed. I think we want to portray ourselves as strong and capable and competent. And I think we want to be respected by peers. I think we want to be approved of by our fathers and our coaches and our bosses. And I think we want the people that we're interested in physically, sexually, romantically to want us. And so we wear masks sometimes to hide the things that we're ashamed of, that we're afraid of. Your mask was the Joker, wasn't it? Certainly in the form of writing. But the value of vulnerable honesty presented itself quickly. I did it not as a means of being vulnerably honest, but because everything hurt so bad, I wasn't afraid of people knowing that I was crying, that I was weak, that I was scared. I'd spent my entire life afraid of people knowing that about me. And then I finally found something worse. So it, it's like it usurped it from like a prioritization standpoint. So I didn't care anymore. I was able to just kind of unload. I mean, the truth is I'm, I'm more afraid today to be 100% honest about vulnerably true things inside of me than I was that. Oh, really? I, all bets were off then. I wasn't afraid of getting hit by a truck for a year. And you know now I'm back to valuing my life and things like that. So bizarrely enough, it's harder to be vulnerable today than at your lowest point. I think in general, and certainly personally, but in this work, I think I'm still very, I don't know if comfortable is the word, but I'm, I'm accustomed to sharing these stories and talking about it. Usually it's done in, in more of a one-on-one -on -one setting. In the book, it's like you're yelling out into the world and it's not obvious to you, anybody's listening. So, Well, thank you for going with your vulnerability today with us and talking about it. Because I think that a lot of men sort of think I'm a good man and therefore I must be a good husband. And so when things don't go particularly well, they get very defensive because they think, you know, I'm a good man, I'm doing my best, I'm doing all these things and it's not enough. So how can, and this is your language rather than my language, how can a good man be a shitty husband? I love that you said it. Thanks for pointing it out. That was, that was my default belief about myself. And I think this thematically will come up more in this conversation. So I'm so excited that you sort of set it up this way. I was certain of my decency. I knew that I loved my wife. I knew that I cared about people in general, that for the previous 33 years of my life, at least all of them that I could remember, my interactions with friends and family were exceedingly positive, like exceedingly. Like if you had like a grade card on like people liking you, I think I did really well. It's possible people lied to me, but I was under the impression I was well liked. And when your spouse, the person you love the most, the person you sacrifice the most for, and she's the one person, she's the one statistical outlier that's like, you make my life miserable. She didn't really say that. But that was like the narrative. It's like, you're the only person who complains about me. You are the literally the only human who says these things, who implies that you're not cared about, that you're not loved, that I'm mean to you. I'm like, I've never heard this from anyone else. And I, I think there's a real danger there. And I think anyone listening, particularly men who have this belief about themselves, will get it. They're so resentful of what appears to be like a lack of gratitude or a lack of fairness from our partner. Because it's like, how can you, of all people, say this about me? And so what becomes the narrative about your wife then? I think that she's selfish, that she's ungrateful, that she's needy, that nothing you ever do is good enough for her, that she's someone who's always trying to find new things to complain about. <laughs> she's always moving the bar. That was, I promise you, and, and forgive for anyone listening, this is not what I believe today. And this I, and is I, what I believed in my marriage very I, strongly. And the reason why I'm laughing is I've come from hearing this. And after we finish speaking, I'll go back and hear more of it. You know, <laughs> Same. And it gets to the point where, you know, I'm married to a crazy woman. And at the same time, the woman is thinking, my husband is unreasonable. I'm married to a boy. What could 
men be doing that makes their women think that they've actually got a third or a fourth or a fifth child rather than a husband? Well, three ideas very specifically, but two behaviors. The idea that I think is so critical in relationships is maintaining trust. And I think a lot of people default to the notion that trust is about when somebody speaks, they're honest, or I trust them to not commit a crime or to not abandon me and the children. I think we think about that notion of trust, but trust runs deeper than that. Trust can be reliability. Can I count on this person to do something? And I think in relationships, it shows up in a couple of very specific ways. And it's all of my works rooted in these two behaviors. And it is validating. Validating to me means in simple terms, if me, a romantic partner, comes to my other romantic partner to try to communicate that, that something's wrong, I'm trying to recruit them to help me solve a problem. I want them to validate it and participate effectively in helping this bad thing I'm experiencing go away. But in marriage, when we perceive our wives to be complaining and nagging and never satisfied, we invalidate in our disagreement or defense of what they're asking for or suggesting, and they're never made whole. And so the narrative becomes, I can't trust my husband, or it's not exclusively men. I can't trust my partner when something's wrong to hear me and to work with me cooperatively in making this thing go away. The second idea, aside from validation that I hyper-focus on, is this notion of consideration. And that, in a nutshell, is I believe the average wife and mother thinks to herself, I consider my husband and my children, in addition to myself, in every decision I make. They are variables in the math equation I use constantly to make a choice, no matter what that choice might be. And I'm married to somebody who doesn't make me a variable always in the equations he uses to make decisions. He often appears to only be thinking about himself. And I think that is more or less in a nutshell why so many relationships between seemingly really good people die slowly on the vine. Talk me through the background to sitting down and writing the blog post, she divorced me because I left the dishes by the sink. I worked a corporate marketing job. I would write for about an hour at lunchtime almost every day. That story popped into my head. This argument I used to have with my wife about a drinking glass that we set by the sink. It honestly wasn't as big of a deal in our marriage as it appears to be in other people's marriages. It was just another in a long line of examples of things where my wife cared about something. And I, I responded in a manner that suggested I didn't think she should care that much. Or that because it doesn't matter to me, it shouldn't matter to you, more or less. But anyway, within about four or five days, it became evident to me that people were interested in that. And within another two days or so, that thing blew up. It was read four or five million times on my blog. It might have been read 20 million times all over the place because big, big websites reran that. Like the Huffington Post was at the height of popularity at the time. And there was an article out of Europe about that article, like I, I, I ended up reading like a news story about myself. And I'm like, this is insane to me. I think it was literally the number one trending thing on the internet for about a half hour at the peak of its popularity. And I mean, there's like really serious things going on in the world. And I don't think that my silly blog posts should be the thing. It's really not even that great, but it really touched a nerve. And no matter how not great I think it is, the numbers speak for itself. People continue to gravitate to this, this like anchor conversation as a means of having a meaningful conversation about what should and should not be allowed to matter in a relationship. Because on one line, you sort of think, why, well, God, this woman's crazy if she's divorcing a guy just over a couple of glasses and things in the sink. Yes, but sir. People know deep down, actually really, really deep down inside, that actually that's exactly how it works. So what I want to do is pull out what you call the invalidation triple threat. The first one is my wife's thoughts are wrong. You say this is the sort of defense of it didn't happen the way you saw it. It wasn't important. Now, why is it wrong to effectively tell your wife that her thoughts are wrong? I think that it's bad for a relationship in the context of safety and trust and feeling respected and feeling loved and feeling cared for, all these really, really critical concepts for long-lasting monogamous 
forever relationships is when every time I try to communicate something to my husband or my partner and he has to correct me, how many times does it take before you start saying to yourself, if my husband has a difference of opinion about what happened or he remembers it differently, he makes me feel like I'm stupid or I'm crazy or I'm unreliable. He's always sort of like trying to correct me or contradict me. You know, this man does not respect me intellectually as an equal. And I think that that begets the loss of trust in a relationship. And what I see in my room over and over again is what I call yes, but. In fact, often people don't even do the yes. They go, let's use your example of um, what happened last night. The woman has complained that the man spent a lot of time talking to one particular woman. And this is not particularly good, but going, yes, but I spoke to a lot of men. As you say, it drives women crazy because it feels like, number one, yes, but isn't a very good, but actually you're not even saying yes, but you're just doing the but. And just think about how it would be different if you did yes and. Yes, I did spend a lot of time talking to that woman. And I also spoke to some other people about football. And so you've accepted what your wife said, and she's heard you accept it. And you've also talked about it from your point of view. So you can say what you need to say just by using the word yes and rather than yes but. Then we come to the second of the invalidation triple threats. My wife's feelings are wrong. Tell me about that. So that definitely applies to the dish by the sink. My wife, in my estimation, elevated a glass, a clean glass, to a marriage problem. She repeatedly brought it up as a means of pointing out something I was doing to make her life worse. And I calculated that her hassling me about this glass was a much greater crime than me leaving the glass by the sink in the first place. But more significantly to the point is, how can you be emotionally affected by this glass? It simply, and it's still, it's not something... I don't speak or think or treat people in this way anymore. But as an individual, I have no meaningful emotional response to someone leaving a glass by the sink in their kitchen, especially one where it's just water and there isn't going to like attract bugs or anything. I, I just don't understand why it's a problem. I don't. So what you're saying is she's overreacting. And why doesn't she just recalibrate her feelings and her thoughts like me? which is yeah. a far better and much healthier way of doing it. That's right. Yeah, I, I thought she should mature. And here's the way my brain thought about it, that life can be hard. And one of the very specific things I used to think about, and this ended up rearing its head in our marriage in a very painful, dark way, was losing a parent. I'm like, that's going to happen someday, right? And I'm like, if you're making a big deal out of a glass by the sink, what are you going to do when something that actually matters happens? Was the bizarre, unsupportive, invalidating relativism game I played. It's just not how you connect with another human being. So I've told you what my clients say. You've told me what your clients say and what you used to say. Now let's translate this for men into what the woman is thinking, which is you don't take my feelings seriously. I think often, I use a lot of metaphor, I think often about the notion of, of someone with a second degree burn wound hiding under a long sleeve shirt. And I think about touching them gently on their arm there, having no idea that there's a burn wound there and having that person yelp out in pain for having been touched on a really sensitive burn wound. If you don't know it's there and all you see is a long sleeve and all you did was lightly touch someone on the arm, the math is someone freaked out because you touched them gently on the arm. That person's crazy. That person has this insane overreaction. But imagine that she pulls up her sleeve and she says, hey, there's a burn wound here. And she shows it to you. And intellectually, I think in real life, we understand burn wounds hurt. And we're like, oh my gosh, I now have context for why she acted that way. I will now understand why if I run my elbow into her arm while we're standing next to each other in the kitchen, why she might yelp out in pain and why after two, three, four instances of that, she might be really frustrated with me for repeatedly doing this thing she asks me not to do because it results in pain. 
And I tried to connect to that idea with this notion of invisible pain, of emotional pain. And when someone reaches out to their romantic partner for help and says, this hurts me, I feel bad when this thing happens, the equivalent of hitting this burn wound, but something invisible per se. What we end up doing, sort of metaphorically speaking, is keep just running our elbow into our partner's wounds and acting like you know they're weak or they're crazy or they're unfair from making it our problem that they have this sensitivity. And I think from a metaphor standpoint, that's not this a radically dissimilar idea from over and over again, a partner coming to her boyfriend or husband or whoever and saying, hey, this hurts me. And I think this response that your feelings are wrong. I understand you're saying this happened and it hurts you, but it doesn't make sense that it hurts you. So, you know, get it together. Like, you know, you're making your ultra sensitive feelings my problem. And I think you need to make your ultra sensitive feelings your problem was the way that I thought about it. And I think the vast majority of people who see a burn wound would totally get it. For reasons unbeknownst to me, we don't seem to treat emotional pain with that same care, particularly when it's connected with an idea that just doesn't logically make sense to us. Because for women, there is nothing more important than feelings. They have been brought up to listen to their feelings, to live their life guided by their feelings and to honour their feelings. If somebody loves you, they're going to do the same. Unfortunately, and this is another great sadness, men have been brought up to try and deny their feelings, to be rational as possible, to hide their feelings and to minimise them. So we are talking a little bit different languages, but there is no worse thing that you can possibly do. And I think this is just as important for women to men as well, is to deny somebody's feelings. It's not a big deal leaving the glass by the sink. And your feelings about me not doing this, despite the fact you've asked me to do it five million times, is over the top and you've denied my feelings, you can sort of begin to see how we're heading towards the divorce courts. But we've still got another joy up our sleeves here. We've got the third of our triple invalidations, which is what you call justified defence. So tell me about justified defence. I, I don't think mechanically defending ourselves is the same as invalidating the mental or emotional experiences or partner, but I think the math result is the same. The math result is, something's wrong and I'm trying to tell my partner about it. So my wife comes in and says, hey, Matt, you know, you did something and it hurt me. And because I'm someone who would never hurt my wife on purpose, ever, I go immediately into an explanation for, well, here's what happened. I might even say, I'm really sorry, but like, hear me out. If you understand what I understood at the time, what I believed, you might make the same decision. This invalidation triple threat thing to me is so dangerous because I do think from a logical standpoint, it makes sense. Our brain says that doesn't make sense. Our body says chemically that doesn't make sense. This is not fair. And when people say something that triggers our sense of this is not true, I feel attacked right now. You're saying I'm in trouble and I honestly don't believe I did anything wrong. It's so difficult to not come to your own defense in that situation. And if you have to do it over and over and over again with somebody who's feeling sensitive and angry and communicating how much your behavior adversely affects their life, it can start to come out as this really insensitive, my feelings and my thoughts and everything that I care about and experience matters way more to me than everything you think and you feel and you care about. And what women say to men in my room is, you're making this all about you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I was going to, that was going to come up <laughs> later too. This idea of when I I'd said earlier, this idea about learning how to make things about other people, not filtering every single thing through the lens of self 24 seven. There's so much potency in this idea of, okay, someone I love is coming to me with a problem. If I defend myself, if I make this about my pain and about how I'm being inconvenienced and about I'm being treated unfairly, I am literally making this moment about me and my wife never wins. 100% of the time she comes to me with a problem and I don't calculate that it's intellectually valid or that if I don't think I did anything wrong, she never ever gets to be the person 
who feels bad and then has her partner help her. It never happens. And trust and safety go away. How long did you think that this triple invalidation threat took to destroy your marriage? I'd be shocked if this weren't true for most people, though. She could handle it until we introduced a third human into the household, having a baby. Bringing a baby into the household changed the world in so many ways. But when there's no trust and there's no safety and this invalidation triple threat thing just continues unabated, despite the emotional complications and the logistical complications of bringing a child into the world and all that that means in our heads, in our hearts, that's where I would trace it today. At the time when I was living it, we lost her father and it was brutal about 18 months before my marriage literally ended. And so we turned to these like tipping points in our memories. But I believe today my marriage died when we brought a baby home and it didn't take her terribly long to calculate. I was not going to be someone she could count on, she could trust to feel safe and loved and considered and respected in our marriage. And she gutted it out for another four years. Because what I sometimes hear from men is, why would you leave and become a single mother and (laughs) actually have even more problems with the children when I'm here to sort of help? And it makes sense from a guy point of view, but explain it from a woman's point of view. Well, that's how I felt about it too. I think that the vast majority of wives and mothers would tell you it's so much easier to not have to calculate for your husband. I think there's a pain when you're raising a child or when you're doing anything, children or not children, anything that is shared responsibility, domestically speaking, when there's evidence that your husband, (laughs) I've got a guy who wouldn't empty dehumidifiers. You have to empty them approximately once every day or two. And I had a guy who just wouldn't do it, not because he's a jerk, forgot, didn't occur to him, didn't matter very much. His wife would fold laundry in their home and look at those lit up dehumidifier lights. And they were a reminder every single day while she's serving her family and not getting acknowledged in any meaningful way that for the 7,000th time, she's asked her husband, a really good guy who everybody likes to empty those dehumidifiers. And he's still after 10, 15 years of marriage, hasn't found it within himself to devise a methodology for going down to doing that either. She, she doesn't matter enough. She just isn't loved, respected, honored enough, or he's choosing not to. The next thing that happens is the women get angry. How good are men at dealing with women's anger? I mean, I was, I was really bad. I don't think I would have ever said it's not okay for you to be angry, but I did think about it in terms of like, pragmatism. If you approach me with anger to solve a problem and you put me on the defense, we're going to have conflict. Yeah. She would be angry. I, I don't know. I don't know what like most men would say. My, my perception is that like me, our defenses go up when we're dealing with anger. I always said I can deal with sadness so much more easily than I can deal with anger. But on the, I like to make the argument for the wives. What do you want them to do? I'm talking to myself, you know, 10 years ago, Matt, what did you want her to do? She asked over and over and over again. And 100% of the time, she didn't matter enough to like honor the request or you blatantly disagreed and refused to participate in it. And she's still feeling hit in the arm with this burn wound. How many years is she supposed to just be calm and demure about it? I would have flipped out too. It, It took a long time to realize that. Because I think men have a bit of a double standard. It's okay for us to be angry, <laughs> yeah. but it's not okay for women to be angry. I've never really quite understood that one. But right. what I think part of the problem is, is that we men think we have to fix our partner's feelings. So if she's angry, it's our job to make her not angry. And so this is sort of going on unconsciously. But if we make the anger less, then there'll be less for us to actually try and solve. So if we can minimise the problem, we can then probably <laughs> solve it rationally. Now, I know it makes absolutely no sense, but that is sort of what I see all the time is people try and rescue their partner's feelings. And what I say is you don't have to rescue your partner. They're an adult. You have to care And you can care by listening, 
And actually, the, one of the most loving things you can do is let sh somebody be angry. You know, you're angry with me because of A, B, C. The, actually, these are the three most loving words in the English language. And they're not I love you. See what you think of this. The three most loving words in the English language are tell me more. Because you really have to love somebody when they're angry to say, tell me more about your anger. I mean, that is true love. What do I you am. think? That is brilliant. I hadn't heard it phrased the way you just did. Tell me more. But what I do is I'm very quick today in a way I wasn't in my marriage to acknowledge the right of someone else to feel hurt and angry because of something I did or didn't do. And moreover, I really seek to understand what that's about. When we invalidate and defend ourselves repeatedly, we never learn that this is actually why, you know, in that dehumidifier example, she wasn't literally mad that he didn't empty the dehumidifier bins. It only takes about 45 seconds. She can do it, <laughs> perfectly capable. What hurts is this idea that I matter so little to my husband. It's so sad to them that after all of these years and all that I give and, and commit to this human being, that I register so small on his radar, that he can't come down and empty these two bins. It takes less than 60 seconds. And then he just defends himself. He's like, I forgot, you know, I'm sorry. And then if she gets mad, he's like mad that she's mad. And he's never like, I am so sorry. What did this communicate? What the absence of doing this work tells you about your value in my life and about the degree to which I love you and respect you, the degree to which you can count on me tomorrow and next month and next year and 10 years from now, because that's the story. I can't trust this person today. What's it going to be like in a year, in five years, in 10 years, where every time I come to this person with a problem and say, please help me, he denies there's a problem or he makes it about him. That's when the decision to leave happens. So when we're talking about my marriage, the decision to leave happened sitting out on my deck. I remember having a drink with her one night and asking, is the reason you didn't want to have another child because you're married to me? And it was one of the hardest things I ever heard. And she said, yes. And I just sat quietly with that for a long time. I've never forgotten it. I still live in this house. This is where we live. I can still like see, I'm looking out at like where I was sitting. And it was, that was a moment. And I resented it a little bit, but I was also sad, but I understood, you know, you know, you know, when you're not showing up for somebody, but you don't necessarily have the vocabulary to like articulate it or like to think about it correctly. But you know, that's when she decided to leave. She just was like, maybe waiting around to see if the light bulb would turn on. <laughs> Who knows what she was doing? I think average guy thinks wife decided five minutes ago to leave and she left and I feel really bad about it. And what is this crazy lunatic lady thinking? But really, I think most thoughtful, loving people who value themselves and decide to enforce healthy boundaries make the decision to leave many months and years before they actually do. And it's just a matter of how to execute it effectively. And if you could go back and coach the Matt that asked that question, you know, about why won't you have another child? Is it because of me? Yeah. And you heard yes. What would you have liked that Matt to say? Tell me more. <laughs> That's what I wish I'd said. I wish I had sat with it instead of feeling sorry for myself and making it about me. I wish I had learned in that moment. I still maybe would have had time then, truly, to restore trust and to say, I really want to understand because I perceive myself to be a good person. I really do. This is honest. I'm not playing any games with you. I feel honestly defensive, not because I'm trying to like say what you're saying doesn't have merit because I don't think I'm as bad as it seems like you're implying. If I could have just made the connection with this notion of trust and safety that people require to feel content in their lives, to feel stable, um, that would have been world changing. 
walk me through how we've got to this point, you know, and to actually hear all of that stuff without defending yourself. I mean, it's the hardest thing in the world to do, but that could have made all the difference at that particular point. I mean, I think it's never too late to say, tell me more to tell you the truth. Yeah, that's fair. She, she probably deserves the conversation. She's been in a relationship for a pretty long time and he's an excellent guy. When you're a divorced father, a man in your child's life and his mother's life, who you perceive to be a really, really good person, is as good as it gets. Mm. Uh, I actually had this conversation, I think, last night um, where I was explaining to somebody, somebody like, that sounds weird. And I'm like, no, when you love your son and you worry about his safety and what he's exposed to and who's teaching him what and who's modeling what for him and what he's seeing between man and woman with like his mother and someone else. I had step parents. So the notion of step parents isn't foreign to me. You just want somebody that you can count on to show up for them when, when something's wrong and, and to not cause harm. And he's definitely that. And so anyway, this idea of really getting intimate and vulnerable with my son's mother, a large part of it is trying to respect boundaries in her personal life, truly, because I would happy to have those conversations with her if she wanted to. I'm not necessarily convinced she does, but I, I don't ask either. So who knows? So we've been talking about what men can do differently. I'm from a school that believes that most marriages collapse because of what both people do. So we've been focusing just on what men could do differently. As a man who's crossed the floor and actually been able to understand how women feel, how can they cross the floor and understand us a little bit better, do you think? I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth on this one issue only. It's in the book too. I think there's real value in knowing that your romantic partner is not harming you in a calculated, intentional way, because that's a really dark place to be. And for years, you'll hear these accusations thrown out. And I have real questions about what that says about a person who would agree to subject themselves voluntarily to the intentional harm of a, a neglector, of an abuser, right? Because that's what that is. Intentional harm is abusive. It's neglectful. Love yourself enough to like do something about that, not just keep voicing your opposition to it. So there's that. I really hyper-focus on personal responsibility. I don't know how to fairly evaluate my, my, what my wife did if I hadn't been harming her. I don't know how to fairly evaluate all of the things that hurt me and upset me, and I, I talk to people about this, I'm like, can we please measure your wife after you have eliminated from the equation all of the inadvertent negativity that you're bringing to the table? I know you don't hurt her on purpose, but you do hurt her sometimes by accident. What if you eliminated that, took responsibility for that, validated it, practiced active, mindful, perpetual consideration of her needs, and then measured the things you don't like? all the negative things she brings to the table. That's my general take. But I think that one of the number one things that I've heard from longtime therapists who are infinitely smarter and wiser than I is this idea of women sometimes communicate in a manner that is perceived as non-direct, non-specific. It's almost like code. It's like, you should know what I need. You should be able to anticipate my needs and you should know what it means when I say this and when I do this. And I side with it a little bit, right? This habit of consideration in a relationship means do the work of truly knowing your partner so that you can guess with some accuracy what is or is not positively affecting your partner so that you can participate in real time in meeting their needs. I'm, I'm with that. But I absolutely understand the notion from the other side where it's maybe you're with somebody who would benefit dramatically from very specific, very clear, very concise communication about what it is you need. And maybe he or she will show up for you if you only articulate it in the very language that they understand. Uh, I've read actually like marketing books on the like, psychology persuasion, which really convinced me that tailoring your communication to your partner specifically, leveraging these ideas about marketing insights, I, I think that's a really powerful idea. I don't know what your take on that is, but I think to be able to put yourself into the other person's shoes and imagine that every word they say is true, whether you think it's true or not, but just from where they're standing, this is how they see it is. 
and just for a while go with that thought and interrogate it in just the same way we're asking men to really interrogate what women are are thinking to actually believe that for a moment that what your husband is saying is true and really go into it and sort of try and unlock the way his brain works in the same way that I'd like him to try and unlock the way your brain works. So what's your relationship status these days? Have you been able to use all of this stuff to make a new relationship? I had this conversation last night too. I have not braved the words. You're my person. I'm with you and no other. And I'm going to love you and honor you all the days of my life. And we're going to start living and behaving as more or less married people do or on the path toward that, whether we literally get married or not. I've not done that. And there's any number of reasons why I'm terrified. I've had a son. I experienced divorce from a four-year-old through childhood my son experienced divorce from a four-year-old to today he's 13. I think I'm more ready than ever emotionally, personally, to do it. I'm not nearly as protective of him as I used to be. A, a major fear of mine was introducing more loss by having a relationship potentially fail with somebody. Or for me, what if I truly love and care about somebody? What if they have children? And what if I sort of fall in love with them and have this like, you know, this it's like a new thing to lose. And I was like, so scared of it. And because again, I, I can sort of empathize with this like step parent life because I have step parents that I love no different than blood relatives. They are my family meaningfully. And so it wasn't terribly difficult for me to picture myself in a situation like that. I do get to practice this though. I do in my dating life, I have honest relationships and they're open and they know who I am. And the best thing is. I get to practice this no matter what. I get to practice validating and I get to practice considering all of the time. But the stakes aren't as high, right? We don't share space. So that makes things a lot easier. And frankly, not nearly as many promises have been made. So it's not apples to apples. And I, I would never pretend that it is. And what would make you allow somebody back into your life and to trust again? It's a great question. I, um, I don't think that I have the answer for that. Is it a specific human being? Is it a specific set of circumstances that, that triggers that? I truly don't know. I can tell you this, in nine years of being a single father, I've ne and I'll be interested in what you make of this. I've never introduced my son to anyone I've dated, ever. He's met a couple by happenstance, but it wasn't, hey, son, dad is dating this woman. Why don't you meet her? It wasn't like that. It was just, he thought she was just like any of my friends. Have you had a conversation with him? Have you actually said, what would it be like if I introduced you to one of my girlfriends? One of my girlfriends, listen. Um, well, <laughs> that's very to funny. a girlfriend of mine then. Sure, thank you, thank you. <laughs> that's very funny. No, not recently. We talked about it, ironically, when we were younger. I, uh, yeah, I guess we were both younger. <laughs> um, one of the first people I dated was... I mean, I don't think this is a great idea, by the way, single men out there who are divorced with children. When he went to school, a mother threw a kindergarten <laughs> birthday party for all the kids. And she happened to be a divorced mother. I'm like, oh, I like her. And so it was one of my like very first like dating experiences. And she was great. But then it opened the door to that conversation with this child who's infinitely less mature than he is today and capable of having this conversation. As a 13-year-old, I would trust him to have some, some pretty organized and mature thoughts about it. He's, he's great. But at the time, as like a kindergartner, he was highly resistant to the idea of having like other kids in his life that he had to like share toys with and share time and space with or having another woman who would be in this sort of parental role competing with his mother on some level. I don't think I needed his sort of demotivation for that, but he nonetheless contributed some. You ask a really good question. I don't know what the boy would say today. He's great. I think he would support me in whatever I wanted to do. I think it would be an interesting conversation myself. <laughs> Maybe I'll give myself some homework. Yes. I'll see him tomorrow. Maybe I'll brave the father-son conversation. And maybe just for fun, I will email you the results of that conversation. Excellent. And I will add what you say on to the end of the podcast.
The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. One of the great advantages of becoming a supporter of The Meaningful Life is you get to write in to us. And this is what this gentleman has done. And let's see what Matt has to say about this letter. Hi, it's been 14 months now since we separated. My wife left me. There was some harsh words spoken over several months. And I told her I couldn't stand the not knowing and told her to go. She'd been searching on the internet for weeks trying to find a place. Obviously, I regret deeply what I had done but nothing has brought her back into the relationship. We've been on holiday four times, attended three weddings, taken long weekends together, spent Christmas together, slept in the same bed when we've been away, but never anything intimate. It now seems as if I'm just a spare part. We buy the kids' and grandkids' birthday presents from both of us. In fact, to the outside, we look as if we're still together, because outside of immediate family, no one knows. I have no idea how to turn this around. I'm not needy or begging. I just love my wife so very much. It's second time around for both of us, and we've been together for 15 years. I'm 61 and my wife is 45. Do I move on or be patient and keep trying to turn the ship around? What do you think? Well, as I imagine it does for you, this is a story that sounds really, really familiar to me. I don't mean this like overly critically. I would have done the identical thing. But he sort of inadvertently, I think, made it about him and said, you know, I can't stand not knowing. But that's more than likely what she was asking for. Is she wanted to know. I, I think this falls very squarely in line with the conversation we've been having. My best guess is when she tries to communicate that something's wrong, she feels on some level unheard and invalidated. Who knows which version of the invalidation triple threat it shows up as. Perhaps he challenges her intellectual experience or emotional experience, or perhaps he's just a very defensive human being when he feels attacked by her. I think... More than likely, the the most common problem that, that she's experiencing would be this absence of consideration, this idea that he doesn't consider her needs when he makes decisions. That's almost always where the conversations that turn into an invalidation situation like stem from anyway. It's this evidence that you didn't meet a need in real time. So I have to tell you about it. And healthy relationships involve the tell me more response And you move on, having increased the amount of trust and intimacy between the two of you, every time somebody expresses, hey, this thing happened and a need was unfulfilled. But what usually happens is the need remains unfulfilled and we're unheard and unseen and uncared for is the emotional experience we have. And I think when those scenarios pile up over the course of many years, and 15 years is more than enough time for that to happen, she starts saying, is this how I want to spend the rest of my life? Or do I want to take the years I have left and go find a meaningful relationship where I don't feel invisible and uncared for every day? And so to me, this man's mission is the restoration of trust in his relationship. And you do that by practicing something different than what you've been doing. You validate habitually and you consider habitually, mindfully all of the time. You don't fail to calculate for how something you do or say might roll downhill and affect someone else. And I think if he did that and he was able to reconcile any of their past pains, whatever those may be, you know, the, the, the tell me more experience, that's so powerful. I'm probably going to, I hope it's okay if I'm yeah, using those in a conversation because it's beautiful. It's simple and beautiful. And if he can leverage that truly so that all of these memories she has of feeling invalidated, of feeling inconsidered, become a healed moment of he gets it. He gets it now. And the math result of the interaction I just had is I feel loved and cared for. I feel a little bit more trust than I did before. Because it seems to me he has no idea why his marriage has ended. And the weird thing is your partner will have told you 300 million times. Um, It's just you haven't actually taken it on board. So try and think like a detective. What is your wife said over and over and over again to the point that you can't hear it anymore and therefore have completely blanked it out because that actually is the crucial piece that you need to address. And so going and saying, 
Actually, you know, when you say ABC, can you walk me through that so I really understand it? Because, you know, I'm aware that you've told me this many times before and I haven't really taken it seriously. Help me understand that. Is that why you left? And they'll go, yes. And that conversation could really turn it round. If you sort of act like a detective, try and actually understand it all from her perspective, whether, you know, you agree with it or not. From her perspective, this is the truth. This is the way she sees the world. I wonder what would happen. And it's worth a try because she's actually saying, I want to be connected to you in some kind of way. Now, it might just be for the kid's sake or the grandkid's sake, but that's enough for you to work with at this point. So, you know, find out what it is and how you could not be a spare part. I love this word, you know, I feel like a spare part. What role would you like to play? What role would she like you to play? Use these questions to see if you can build a dialogue. I hope that's been helpful. So, Matt, you've been a witness today on The Meaningful Life. Let's turn that question to you. What makes your life meaningful? It didn't feel very meaningful when my marriage ended, as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. I really feel like the ends of meaningful relationships can de deprive, not the word, rob or steal or remove a sense of purpose from someone's life. And I think sometimes men maybe even feel that more profoundly than women at the end of a relationship. And that's anecdotal. I, I perceive men would likely report that in higher mathematical numbers than women following divorce, that the most meaningful thing in my life was my marriage, was my family, and now it's gone. It's like, what's the point? Which, right, would make the women who have had the same conversation three million times sort of like chuckle sardonically like, what are you even saying right now? You never acted like I mattered. You never acted like this mattered. Anyway, this work, this work has been so powerfully transformative for me to be able to leverage the worst thing that ever happened to me and then have the opportunity to participate in these conversations with you or with anybody that might reach out to me personally or professionally and just talk because my highest value, and I think we're going to talk about this in a little bit too, the quality of our human relationships is profoundly important to me. And then of course, I'm a father. I love my son intensely. He's, he's great. He's 13 now. And we have, I think, a really cool relationship. He gives my life a lot of meaning. He gives my life a lot of purpose. Scary because he might move out in five years, six years, and then, oh no. And I become this like bizarre divorced guy, like empty nester potentially. Who knows? Like, you know, that, that does scare me. But those are really the big two for me. Well, thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us today. In a moment, Matt and I will be talking about the three things he knows deep down to be true and a bit of sort of post-match analysis. But you only get that if you're a supporter of The Meaningful Life. And to find out how you can become a supporter, here are all the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you. Before we end, I promised to give you an update on what happened with Matthew after he spoke to his son and he promised to send us a message. And this is the email he sent me. I spoke with my son. He's 13. I asked him very specifically how he would feel if I introduced him to a girlfriend or even just someone I was dating. And he calmly, maturely, thoughtfully replied, he'd be 100% good with that. And they didn't believe that would ever be a problem which relieved some mental emotional pressure on the subject. Seems as if you might have suspected something that could happen. 
incredible pleasure meeting you. And that was the email that Matthew sent me. So I think we can finish on a really positive note, which is if you face up to difficult material rather than running away from it, it nearly always turns out better than you think. So thank you for joining me on The Meaningful Life this week and that you'll join me many times in the future as well.